provisional governments are much like first drafts. Each is a work in progress. All is in place. In times of crisis, stopgap measures prevail only until an orderly political process can establish a new and permanent regime. Likewise, initial drafts are mere shadows of a polished, final, and improved composition. Consequently, few are the folks who pay much heed to either first drafts or provisional administrations. The days and weeks following the come and take it fight certainly qualify as a time of crisis. Delegates to the announced consultation of 1835 dribbled into San Felipe. On October 11, 1835, the Committee of Safety proclaimed an interim government. This body administered civil affairs until a quarrel arrived in town. Boldly styled the Permanent Council, it lasted but 20 days before the requisite number of delegates arrived and the consultation supplanted. Yet they were 20 decidedly productive days. Enlisting Kentucky-born merchant Thomas F. McKinney, who enjoyed excellent credit in New Orleans, the council secured a $100,000 loan, procured provender for the army, contracted privateers, established a postal system, bade the land offices closed, and further surveying halted and broadcast calls for volunteers in the old states. On November 3rd, consultation members began their deliberations. Delegates elected Branch T. Archer, war party militant, cousin killer, and the man who in 1832 had invited Sam Houston to Texas as president of the assembly. The first and most pressing order of business was to determine the justification for a war that was already raging. Texans all agreed on why and who they were fighting against, but could not concur on exactly what they were fighting for. No one's surprised, Archer and his fellow war party delegates, John A. Wharton and Henry Smith, urged outright and immediate independence from Mexico. Led by Vermont native Don Carlos Barrett, moderate delegates, deemed such precipitous action premature and countered that it only served to alienate Mexican Federalists who might serve as useful allies. General Austin dispatched a long letter advocating a measured course. Stymied in his independence endeavors, at least temporarily, Archer proposed that the consultation proclaim Texas a state in the toppled Mexican Republic and declare common cause with those Mexican Federalists who still opposed Santana and his centralist despotism. Following two and a half days of deliberation, the delegates voted on the central issue of independence. On November 6th, 14 voted for the proposition but 33 rejected. With that critical question settled, they quickly proceeded to draft a declaration of causes to validate the conflict. The next day, the group issued the Declaration of the People of Texas. The document asserted that the Texians had resorted to violence only because General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana and other military chieftains have, by force of arms, overthrown the federal institutions of Mexico and dissolved the social compact 
which existed between Texas and other members of the Mexican Confederacy. The authors further explained. They hold it to be their right during the disorganization of the federal system and the reign of despotism to withdraw from the union, to establish an independent government, or to adopt such measures as they may deem best calculated to protect their rights and liberties. But they will continue faithful to the Mexican government so long as that nation is governed by the Constitution and laws that are formed for the government of the political association. In other words, Texians were fighting, officially at least, as Federalist Mexicans to restore the Constitution of 1844. Unofficially, Archer, Wharton, Smith, Houston, and the other war partiers bided their time, trusting, as they always had, that the majority would eventually catch up with them. They would not have to wait long. Delegates then shifted their attention to the construction of an organizational structure. In accordance to the so-called organic law, the governor, a lieutenant governor, and a general council composed of a representative from each Texian municipality were to supervise the transactions of the provisional government. The emissaries elected Kentucky native and war party promoter Henry Smith, governor, and Indiana lawyer James W. Robinson, lieutenant governor. It was a calamitous choice. While the delegates pledged their support for Mexican federalism, they elected an executive officer who ached for independence. Even worse, they neglected to define the powers of the executive and legislative branches. Members of the General Council possess no legislative authority unless, in their opinion, the emergency of the country requires it. The legislation allowed them to impose import duties but no domestic taxes. It further granted Smith full and ample executive authority that included command of revolutionary military units. Moreover, the council might grant the governor unspecified powers if its members deemed them necessary. The lack of a clear description of the authority and limits of government officers was an omission that planted the seeds of political pandemonium. Next, the delegates pondered the organization of a regular army. Already, the limitations of an all-volunteer military force were becoming apparent. On November 3rd, General Austin wrote to urge the absolute necessity of organizing a regular army and inviting a military man of known and tried talents to command it. Houston had just such a man in mind, Sam Houston. His fellow legislators agreed. He had won unanimous election as commander of the regular army with the rank of major general. As commander, Houston, in theory, took control of all the forces called into public service during the war. Nevertheless, his fellow delegates explained in no uncertain terms that he had no authority, absolutely none, over the volunteers already serving under Austin's command. Houston was commander of the regular army, the only catch being that such a force only existed in the fertile imaginations of San Felipe politicians. If Houston wanted to command a regular army, he would first have to raise and organize one. 
Yet notwithstanding his specific instructions, he thought that it would be much easier to simply borrow Austin's army. Stephen F. Austin, the one man who possessed the moral authority to head any Texas government, was commanding the army of the people. His unique talents probably would have been more used in a civilian capacity. Other political operatives, Archer, Smith, and Houston, attempted to assume Austin's traditional role, but none of them quite filled the bill. The willingness of the War Party delegates to accept a more moderate course allowed the consultation to function, at least for the short term. Even so, because of its transitory nature, few Texans, and even fewer Tejanos, expressed any confidence in the government's rationale or organization of the provisional government. Most Texans behaved as they always had. They flouted political pronouncements and did as they pleased. Meanwhile, outside there, General Austin and the Texian army faced problems of their own. 